They shot up one, lit it up. They just kept shooting at it. They, they, they fired all kind of ordnance on it. We just left a new uh, nighttime navigation aid out there so that you can see it from the fire. I'm Danny Rivera and I was in the Navy from 1977 to 1997. I was a sonar technician, got out as a chief petty officer. And when I say sonar technician, I was a, an STG, which is sonar technician general, which means I was in the surface fleet. If you're a submariner or a bubblehead, that's a STS, sonar technician submarine. So I was an STG. I grew up in East LA. I lived up in the city terrace area and it was considered kind of rough because when I was in high school, I went to high school in Cantwell, high school in Montebello. And I, sometimes I tried to get a ride from, from guys that weren't from my neighborhood and they asked me where I was from and I tell them where I'm from. And, and they're like, says, you're up there by Garrity, right? And he says, yeah. And I said, no, I'm not taking you home because <laughs> just the gangs and everything else, you know, everybody was afraid of it, but it wasn't a big deal for us. You know, I mean, we just knew who to avoid and, you know, where not to be at a certain time. So it wasn't that big a deal. When I was growing up, my dad was kind of strict with us because actually my brothers and I had a, had a conversation one time when, when we were older and we were just thinking like, how come none of us ever got involved in a gang? And we all came up with the same answer. It was like, no, nah, because sooner or later that stuff comes back to the house. And if it ever came back to our house, you know, she, dad would have just kicked us out. And our dad overheard the conversation. He said, no, I said, I want to kick you out. I just, you know, my attitude with you guys was the same one your grandpa had with us when we were growing up. And that's, you can go out, have your fun, do what you want to do. But if you end up in jail, I'm not getting you out. He was also, you know, really involved with us because I was in the Boy Scouts and I was in the Cub Scouts and then the Boy Scouts. And then my dad was involved with that. He was there with all the other dads and we go out on the weekends, we go camping. My dad and all his brothers, all my uncles, were all in the army. So my dad served in Germany, and my uncle, my uncle Gibby, he also served in Germany. My uncle Ray was 82nd Airborne. My uncle Tootie, he joined the army also, but I think when he was in boot camp, he said he got, something came up, he got disqualified, so they had to let him go. He was doing KP, he says, because I was washing dishes, man, my hands were already blistered, and then they tell me, you know, I gotta get out, you know, so. I decided I wanted to join the Navy because, you know, back then it was join the Navy, see the world, you know, so that sounded good to me, but I actually wanted to join to the uh, Naval Academy, but ended up not going because my, my grade in uh, physical science, I got a D in physical science. And that's only because the teacher didn't let us, me and this other guy, take the final exam. Cause he says, nah, you guys got D's going in. If you take the exam, you're gonna flunk, so go home. You know, I came home, I was, I was all depressed. You know, I was all bummed out about it. And I came home and I told my dad, my dad was the kind of guy that he would lecture you. you know? When we were smaller and we screwed up, you know, we'd get a spanking, you know, he'd get a belt and he hit us, you know, on the butt, you know, it would be a, a thick belt and he'd hit you on, on the butt. So it doesn't really hurt, you know, but you're a kid. So, you know, to you, it hurt. But then when you got older and then you started faking tears, you know, then he'd get a real skinny belt and then he hit you behind the thigh. And it's, it's like, yeah, shit, that hurts. You know, as we got older, you know, the belt went away and it just came to uh, lectures. You know, if you screwed up, then you just had to sit and hear a lecture. And, you know, at that time, it was like, shoot, just hit me with the belt. You know, it's like, I don't want to hear the lecture. Got no sympathy from him whatsoever. He was like, see, I told you, you got to do your homework. You got to apply yourself. You got to do what you got to do. And I was like, I was mad. You know, I got mad. I was like, you know what? He's like, fine. You know, I just... Went out the door, slammed the door, went down to the recruiting station and I joined the Navy. Some guys got motivated by watching Top Gun. Well, back then when I was growing up on TV, it was Mikhail's Navy. It's about a crew, a PT boat crew. It's like they had beer in the torpedo tube. They had, you know, comic books in the 50 caliber magazine box. They went to all these cool places. They went to like New Caledonia, Numea, New Caledonia for Liberty. They go to Australia, but they kick butt, you know, they go out. You know, they'll sink ships, they'll sink submarines, they'll shoot down planes, they do their job, you know, and as long as they do their job, Lieutenant Commander Mikhail, he didn't care what these guys did on their off time, you know, so they can sleep late, they can do whatever they want. As long as they do their job, that's all he cares about. I thought that was cool. 
So that kind of inspired me to join the Navy. I went down to the recruiting office on Whittier Boulevard. Back then, they had all four branches in the same building. So I went down there. When I arrived, you know, I stopped by, I looked at the, the Navy office, and the guys weren't there. And the Marine recruiter was, you know, he was right next, next to these guys. So, so I asked him, I says, hey, do you know where, where the Navy recruiter's at? He says, yeah, those guys went to lunch. He says, they'll be back in about an hour. He says, you can hang around if you want. He says, yeah, I'll sit down. I'll, I'll wait. And he was like, can I interest you in the Marine Corps? I was like, no, dude, no, 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 no. It's like, I'm joining the Navy. So these guys showed up, the Marine, he was a, he was a corporal. And he tells him, he says, hey, this guy's been waiting for you guys for an hour, but he was a first class. And he says, damn, man. It's like, you guys, you would you waited around for an hour. You must really want to join the Navy. He says, come on in, you know? So I talked with him. I told him, he says, I just want to be a gunner's mate. All I want is to be on a warship. You know, I don't want to be on a supply ship. I don't want to be on an oiler or anything like that. I, want, I just want to be on a warship. So he said, okay, well, you know, it's like, took the as back then it was the ASVAB test. So we took that. He called me in. He says, yeah, we got your results back. You know, it's like, so I asked him, I said, so can I be a gunner's mate? And he says, Dude, you can be anything you want, you know, except, you know, nuclear. You know, you can't go nuclear. You just, you didn't call, you didn't score high enough for that. But you want to go into electronics? You know, I was like, like what? I went with a sonar technician. And my recruiter was actually pretty good because, you know, like when you get to boot camp and everybody talks about the recruit, whenever recruiters come up, everybody says, you know, what are you going to do when you go on boot camp leave? You know, I was like, I'm going to go back and kick my recruiter's ass, you know, because he lied to me. My recruiter didn't lie to me. He told me, he says, you know, you know what? You played football so in high school, so you can handle the physical stuff. It's not going to be that bad. You're going to miss home for a little bit, and then but you'll get over it, and it's not going to be that bad, you know? So so my recruiter, like I said, I was the only one that didn't want to kick his ass when I got out and, and went home on leave. Boot camp for me was, for the most part, it was pretty easy for me. When I was still in high school, my junior year, a friend of mine, who was a senior, he went into, I don't know if you ever heard about it, Devil Pups. So for people who don't know, it's just a program for kids from 14 to 17 or 18. It's a citizenship program. But basically, back then when I went, it was run by the uh, Marine Corps Reserves. And you went down to Camp Pendleton for 10 days. And you basically went around, you saw what Marines did. You got to do some of the things that Marines did. And they actually took us down to MCRD in San Diego and took us to uh, how, where they process Marines when they first come in. And they actually ran us through that. There was this drill instructor, you know, he was just like hollering at us. You know, we were like in this cargo or, you know, this uh, bay where trucks back up into the loading docks and we we're just outside there. And he was just telling us to get in, get in and get tight, get tight. And everybody's like squeezing in tight. And he's still yelling at us and everything. And, and you're thinking, this guy knows we're not in, we're not Marines, right? He knows we're not in boot camp, right? This guy scared us shitless, man. After he was done, you know, it's like, you know, then he put on his, his smiling face, you know, it's like, just want to let you pups know this is how we treat the Marines when they first come in. Do you, anybody have any questions? And everybody's like, heck no, man. I'm not going to ask no question. Nah, it's a setup. <laughs> you can ask him a question. He's going to yell at us some more. But so I went through, uh, through devil pups. I did those two um, 10 days. I lost two inches off of my waist in those 10 days, right? And I was going through uh, varsity football summer workouts and I didn't tell my coach that I was going, you know? So when I came back, you know, I came back with the, the boot camp haircut and I came back lighter, you know? <laughs> and he just looked up at me and he said, devil pups, right? He says, yeah. He says, he didn't say anything to me about you going to devil pups. He says, I almost kicked you off the team, you know? But since you went to devil pups, you're good. When I went to boot camp, to Navy boot camp back then, it wasn't that hard, you know, to me, for me, it wasn't that hard. Like after the first uh, four weeks, cause it was only eight weeks long back then. And it was in San Diego. So after the first four weeks, you did four weeks on Worm Island. And then you went over to the advanced side and you did your other four weeks. And they had a chief warrant officer come by and he uh, interviewed everybody in the, in the company. And he was asking, you know, what you thought about boot camp if it was, you know, too hard and whatever. And he asked me what I thought. And I said, actually, I thought it's too easy. He's like, too easy? He says, yeah, I, I wanted to come to boot camp and I wanted to basically, you know, get my ass kicked so I can go back home and I can tell my friends and brag about it. And I'm like, I can't really brag about it, man. It's like, it was, it was too easy, you know? And I told him, I said, dude, I went to, you know, I went to double pups and, you know, that shit was harder than this, you know? So he was just writing down his notepad and he was just like, 
Okay. You know, the only time it was hard was on a Sunday. You know, Sunday we're supposed to clean up the barracks in the morning and then we have holiday routine, but the assistant master at arms at the time, recruit master at arms, he said, yeah, don't bother cleaning up this morning. You know, just, just relax, you know. So the company commander came in and of course he saw that we hadn't done anything. So this was in summer. Okay. This was summertime in San Diego. So he told us to close all the windows in the barracks. Everybody go get their raincoat, put it on. And then we just PT'd, you know, just did physical training for about half hour straight, you know, just push ups, jumping jacks, burpees, run around the whole barracks, do it all over again. All the windows fogged up, right? Because it was all closed, everybody's sweating. All the windows fogged up. You couldn't see out the windows anymore. And then when it was done, I had a puddle of sweat by my bunk. I swear about that long and, you know, that wide, right? So I went over to the head and to the shower area where we kept the, the swabs and I was grabbing a swab and then the company commander was like, STG1 Kovar, I remember that guy. He says, what are you doing, Rivera? I says, I got to swab up some sweat by my, my bunk. What are you talking about? I says, sir, I got, I got a puddle of sweat like this and this. You know, he's like, bullshit. He's like, show me. I walked him over there. I showed him. He's like, damn. It's like, well, what you waiting for? Swap that shit up. So that was like, that was the only time it really got extremely physical for me, you know. For boot camp was in San Diego. From there, I went to Fleet Anti-Submarine Warfare Training Center, Pacific, San Diego. So it's right, it's right behind NTC, Naval Training Center. I went there for my basic sonar school. And back then, the sonar was actually, you know, if, you, if you've seen the old World War II uh, submarine movies, you know, anti-submarine movies, whatever, where it just shows you, a, it's just got like a round console, a round display, and then it just pings, and then the circle just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And then it, it picks up a, an echo, and then you track it. That's what I learned on. You know, that's the kind of system I had. It was like SQS-23 sonar, and uh, it was just like that. If you ever saw the movie The Bedford Incident with Wally Cox, he was a sonar operator. It looked just like that. That sonar stack was exactly what I, what I stood watches on. I learned general or my basic sonar there, my sonar A school. And then I went back to NTC for basic electricity and electronics. And then I came back to ASW base. And then there I learned my, I got my C school, which was Mark 114 underwater battery fire control computer. Basically it was all analog. It was a whole entirely analog system. And I got out of that class by the skin of my teeth. You know, it's like electronics. It didn't come easy for me. You know, it's like I had to, I had to really study it. I was a, a Mando commando, you know, mandatory night study. Got out by the skin of my teeth, you know. When I went into boot camp, I was a, an E3 right off the bat because I went advanced electronics and became a sonar technician. And then when I graduated boot camp, I became an E4. So I was like, you know, I was like an E4 out, out the box. When I went to my C school, you know, and then when you graduate C school, you know, guy at the top of the class, he gets pick of the orders, you know, which ship he wants to go to. We had a lot of guys from the East Coast and they all, you know, wanted to go back to the East Coast. And then we had guys on the West Coast, they wanted to stay on the West Coast. They had two billets for Pearl Harbor, you know, for two ships out in Pearl Harbor. And only one guy wanted it. And then everybody else, you just go down the line. And I was thinking like, oh man, I would love to go to Pearl, but she, I'm, I'm bottom of the list. You know, it's like, I'm not going to get it. And then everybody just wanted to go to the East Coast or stay in San Diego or maybe go to San Francisco. And even the instructor, the instructor was saying like, I thought you guys joined the Navy to see the world. Shit, you guys just want to stay home, you know? And then it finally came down to me and it's like, he goes, Rivera, what do you want? I said, shit, I'm going to Pearl Harbor, man. Like, it was a USS Cochran uh, DDG-21. It's an Adams class, got a missile destroyer. I think the keel got laid back in the 60s. So it was basically a Vietnam era ship. When I first got there, it was pretty cool. It was really good. Checked on board, take me down to the, uh, the birthing compartment. They assigned me one guy. He basically stuck with me. I reported on Friday, I think. So he stuck with me on the weekend. You know, he made sure I... 
I knew where the mess decks were, where I had to go to eat, you know, how to get to my bunk, you know, where sonar control was, where all our, our spaces were. The guys are really good, but it turns out like, you know, my name's Danny. So there was like 20 guys in that division. And we had like, I was like the third Danny, you know, so that, so first thing I heard was like, oh man, this is going to get confusing. You know? So I told him, Hey, just, uh, just call me Pico. That's what they called me in high school because my last name is Rivera. So we got a city out here called Pico Rivera. So they said, yeah, they call me Pico, which was really kind of funny because my cousins from Santa Ana, they vacationed in uh, Waikiki. So they came out to the base to see me. So like, you know, they came down to the ship and they actually asked for, for Danny Rivera on the quarter deck and the guys on the quarter deck are like, don't know him. <laughs> you know, they're like, yeah, he's here. He's, he goes, are you sure he's stationed on this ship? Well, yeah, he's on this ship. I was coming up on the starboard side on the weather deck, walking towards the quarter deck. And then they saw me and they'd like, that's him right there. And then the guys on the watch, they look and it's like, oh, Pico, why didn't you say so? You know? And then my cousins were like, who's Pico? <laughs> and so I had to tell them. So I was a underwater battery fire control system technician. We had to go out and we had to qualify. That's all we do. You know, ships do is like, you just practice for, you just practice your job, right? That's what you got to do in case for combat, you guys are ready, whether it's damage control, firing weapons, tracking a target, you know, tracking planes. That's what we do. Anyway, we had to go out to the range and we actually got to track a submarine and we were supposed to fire an exercise shot, exercise torpedo, and then an exercise ASRA. We went out three times to the range because, you know, the first time we went out, the sonar crapped out, okay? And then the guys had to fix the sonar, but they didn't fix it in time because we ran out of time on the range. So we had to go back in with our weapons. Captain was not happy. And the second time we went out, we fired the uh, torpedo, the over the side shot, but we didn't get the chance to shoot the ASROC because the ASROC launcher, launcher had a problem, all right? And again, they were trying to troubleshoot it well, we're on the range, but we ran out of time. So we had to go back in with our weapon. Captain's getting pissed now. And then the third time we went out and my division officer, you know, he told us before we did the exercise, he got us together and he says, that weapon is leaving the rail. He says, I don't care if it comes anywhere near the target, but we're not pulling back into port with that damn weapon. All right. It's leaving the rail today. He says, Captain's on my ass. You know, he says, we're not going back in port with that weapon. Everything's working. Okay. We're on the range, we just can't find the sub. So finally, towards the last, you know, we got the, the last 15 minutes of the range time, right? And then sonar finally picks up the submarine. We're tracking it on the fire control computer. I'm sitting as fire, co uh, fire control petty officer. On the firing console, we had like a, uh, what we call a Christmas tree light, okay? You have a set of lights and you have like red and green, okay, going all the way down. They finally pick up the target, we're tracking it, and I got a green board one. I said, I got a green board one. He says, stand by. I take it to stand by. And then one of the lights turns red. Okay. So I was like, I lost my green board. He's like, what happened? Don't know. He says, let's try it again. You know, so I reset it. And then I got my green board back. I says, green board one. He says, go to stand by. I go to stand by. I lose it again. You know, it goes back to red. So everybody's freaking out, you know, and ASW officers, like Mr. Lundquist, you know, he's like, don't do this to me, Rivera. You know, it's like, what's going on? You know, so we just start breaking out the long lines, you know, the long lines are these schematics, big, long schematics. You can trace a signal everywhere, you know, from sonar to the launcher. You know, my leading petty officer, Dick Conklin, he's like, he's just flipping switches left, you know, left and right. Doesn't even know what he's doing. And I'm like, it's like, Dick, get your hands out of there. You know, I'm like slapping him away. And we're just trying to figure stuff out. Everybody's looking, everybody's, you know, looking at the schematics. And then I just happened to notice the, that one light, it keeps coming back and forth, you know, it'll go back to, to not ready and it'll go back to green board one. It'll go back to the not ready and it'll go to green board one. And I just happened to notice, you know, so I told, and the captain's like, he's on the other, he's up on the bridge. He's screaming through the sound powered phones at the ASW officer, you know, cause I can hear the ASW officer apologizing left and right. And uh, so then I tell Mr. Lundquist, I said, Mr. Lundquist, tell the captain we can shoot. He says, what? You found out what you found out what the problem is? He says, no, just tell him we can shoot. You know, I was like, all right, captain, you know, so we can shoot. He says, all right. And we're down to like five minutes, right? We do it again. It's like, okay, I got a green board one going to standby. I take it to standby. 
I lose the light again, right? And Mr. Lundquist freaking out. He's like, damn it, Rivera, you told me we were going to shoot. I said, just hang on a minute. Just hang on. The light came back, and I didn't even wait for him to say fire. I, mean, I just took it over, and I shot. And the, the bird, you, know, you just hear the roar. It's like, boom, it leaves the rail. You know? And Mr. Lundquist was like, damn. He was like, I don't give a shit where it lands. I don't care. You know, it's just gone. That's all I care about. I thought you said you fixed it. I said, no, I never said I fixed it. I said we could shoot. I said, so what happened? I was like, I just happened to notice whenever we rolled to starboard, we lost the green board. Whenever we rolled back to port, it came back. So that's what I, that's what I fired on. You fired on that? I said, yeah. I said, he was like, fuck it. I don't care. It's gone. It's gone. You know? So it was funny. What turned out what it was up in the, the launcher captain control station by the launcher, we have a relay. There's a relay. And basically, it just has two analog like servos, okay, and they're plugins, all right, and one's for bearing and one's for range. What happened was every time we rolled to starboard, pop out, it would separate. I mean, you can put it in, it's got like two screws on either side of the module, and you screw it in, but apparently they worked themselves out a little bit, so every time it rolled to one side, it would pop out, and when it rolled back, it popped back in again. I think the day before, we had uh, an exercise shooting the five-inch guns, you know, so those just like vibrated everything, and it it made it loose. Deployments back then were probably like, there'd be like a, maybe a year and a half, two years in between deployments, you know, depending on which ship you were on at the time. You know, I was on the Cochrane for two years and then I went back to San Diego and then I was on the Gray, which was an FF, fast frigate, FF 1054. I was on there for like a year. And then I went to, back to ASW for another sonar school for 23 pair. Back to Pearl Harbor on the USS Goldsboro, DDG-20. When I went to the Goldsboro, my second ship in Pearl Harbor, uh, we had been on deployment. We were on a Westpac, and we were coming back. We were coming back from the Philippines. It takes us like five days to get from the Philippines back to Pearl. And there was a storm that was like, you know, chasing us the whole time. And then they were saying, goes, uh, yeah, this storm, you know, we're just trying, just trying to stay ahead of it. And we're getting into Pearl. And, and we were gone for six months, right? So everybody's, you know, looking forward to getting back. But then, you know, like the day before we pull in, you know, they make the announcement. They said, yeah, the storm that's been chasing us, you know, it's, it's been increasing in intensity. So it could hit the islands as a hurricane, you know? So when we get in, when we get in, we put down Liberty Call, you guys, be near a phone. If you're going home, be near your phone because there might be a recall because we may have to get on the way for storm evasion. So we pulled in and I was like, okay, fine. You know, I wasn't married or anything. So I just, I figured I'm just going to go, you know, do my laundry ashore, come back and then head out, you know, go out for, for the night. So I went to the laundry mat, did my laundry, came back to the ship, took a shower. As I was drying off, they make the announcement, Liberty secured make preparations for getting underway. You know, I was like, damn it. You know, it's like, if I was a little faster, I could have got out of here. We're making preparations to get underway. They do a general recall, you know, guys are showing up, but I think we only got underway with maybe, you know, a little more than half the crew. So we're at sea and anchor detail. Okay. So, you know, guys are out there on deck. They're taking in the lines. You have guys up on the forecastle, and they stay up there because while we're in the channel, the reason they're up there is like, if for some reason we drop a load and you know we lose steerage or we lose, you know, just can't maintain the, the ship's movement, you know, they're up there to drop the anchor if they have to. That way we don't, you know, run aground while we're in the channel. Okay. So anyway, uh, my station was down at sonar control, and that's two decks down. We're heading out, and it's kind of rough in there in the channel, and then. We're sitting there in sonar control, and then all of a sudden, it sounds like loud, crushing noise. You know, it sounded like somebody took a dump truck and just dumped a whole load of bricks onto the main deck on the forecastle. That's what it sounded like. And what it was, while we're still in the channel, a wave came up over the bullnose and hit the ship. And it washed all those guys that were up by the bullnose because they were, like I said, they were standing by the anchor chain, you know, to let it go if they had to. So this wave took all these guys and just washed them all the way back into the uh, the windbreaks. See the weapons officer 
ended up with uh, an imploded, rib, uh, imploded lung, a broken ribs and imploded lung. We had another guy, they said he broke, broke his leg. The first lieutenant, he got washed over the side, but he, he washed up on Hickam Air Force Base. He just had, ended up with a, a fracture, a hairline fracture on his hand. And one kid got killed. He ended up on the lifelines uh, with a broken neck. And he was the only one that in Hawaii that got killed from the storm directly. A buddy of mine, Rick Watkins, he, he went up and uh, he was helping with the, with the wounded. He went to move one guy, he went to, he was at his legs, so he put his hands underneath his thighs and he went to lift. And he said he almost passed out because the guy's femur just, it looked like he had a knee right in the middle of his, you know, of his thigh, you know, cause that's where it broke, it broke clean through. We didn't have a doc, you know, we didn't have a corpsman on board. They couldn't heal, you know, a doctor to us because it was just too damn rough. We were the last ship out. Well, we reported our, our uh, casualties to Commander Third Fleet. And then he said, okay, that's it. You know, nobody else is leaving the harbor. Just everybody double up on your lines, breast out on your lines, you know, just going to ride it out. And all the ships that, were, that stayed in, you know, they were fine. I think there was a ship behind us and, and that was it. You know, he didn't let anybody else sortie out of the, out of the harbor. We made it out, out of the harbor. So now we're out underway at sea. We were standing watch down in sonar control, but we didn't even bother lighting off the equipment because, you know, you're not, number one, you're not going to see anything in, in those conditions. But, and we were just basically there to, to report any leaks. If something broke through, whatever, that's what we were there for. And in sonar control, you know, we have the, the chairs where you're standing, your watch at the sonar console, at the fire control consoles, and they have, you know, seat belts on them too. But it was too rough to stay in there. So all we did was like, we just got our blankets off our bunks, threw them on the floor and just laid down on them. Too violent to sit in the chairs. But it was actually kind of fun because basically we were just kind of like having races on, you know, just getting shuffled back and forth on the deck, you know, on our on our blankets. We set material condition zebra, which is, you know, you button up the ship, make it as watertight, water, you know, watertight as possible. You know, the ship got the hell kicked out of it that night. But the next day, when the storm was over, it was the most beautiful day at sea I've ever seen. You know, because it was like the skies were just blue. The water was like glass, you know. And this is the, I would see like the water like glass when we were in the Indian Ocean. You know, that was the only other time I'd seen it like that. But I never saw it, you know, in the Pacific. But this time, it was like glass and it was a really deep blue and the sky was a real deep blue. There was not a cloud in the sky. It was just, it was beautiful. And I never seen one like, I never seen a day like that again at sea. Back in 87, I was on the William H. Stanley, a guided missile cruiser, 32. We went to the Persian Gulf. The pucker factor was a, was a big deal then because everybody was just like standing by. Everybody was like, you know, ready to shoot, you know, not wanting to take a hit. We were there for Operation uh, Earnest Will. And so basically what happened was Iraq and Iran were, were at war. So they were supposed to contain their war to like, you know, half of the Gulf. You know, it's like the half that was on, that bordered on Iran. That was supposed to be the battlefield or they're supposed to contain their war in there. But Iran decided, hey, you know, they threatened everybody. They says, we're gonna, they had silkworm missiles all along the Straits of Hormuz. So they were threatening to use those to uh, interfere with Iraq's oil, oil, boat, oil ships. Kuwait, you know, they decided they reached out to the United States and they said, hey, you know, we want, would like you guys to escort our oilers out of here, you know, through the Gulf. So what they did was they reflagged the Kuwaiti tankers uh, as United States tankers, you know, they had a U.S. crew or at least a U.S. skipper. They were flying U.S. flags. We could then escort them in and out. It was interesting because we were just supposed to do the Kuwaiti tankers, the reflag Kuwaiti tankers. But then like every tanker in the area, you know, they would just fall in line. You know, every small ship in the area would just fall in line. So we ended up escorting all these ships, you know, through the Straits of Hormuz. And while we're running through the straits, we're at general quarters. We had these army special forces helicopters they call sea bats. And these things were cool, man, because like they folded up the fuselage, you know, folded up so you can put two of them. We fit two of them in our hangar and they would do night ops. Right. And they had all this cool, you know, night vision gear. 
And it's really funny because in comparison, like when a Navy lands a helo at night, the lights are all on, on the, on the helo pad, you know, on the helo deck. But these Army guys, they didn't do that, right? They were just like come in skimming along the surface and then they get to the side of the ship and they just kind of like, boom, you know? They just pop on there, no lights, nothing whatsoever, you know? They were cool. I think they had like 20 millimeter, like Gatling guns, you know? That's what, that's what they were using. That's what they had, they were armed with. They stayed with us for about a week, you know, and then they went to other ships, you know, throughout the Gulf. Well, these guys caught the Iranians laying mines down in the area that we just went through the night before, you know, literally. We were there the night before, that's where they were laying mines. They had the night vision, you know, they, basically they, they called it into a commander third fleet. Third fleet says, you got video, you know, it's like tape them. And it says, yeah, we got it. You know, they're, they're putting mines in and then it was like, light them up. The name of the ship was the Iran Ijar. On our ship, you know, it's like you're up in the combat information center and you can hear the, the radio communications. Every, every skipper in the Gulf is like, you know, asking permission to head on down there, you know. We're also involved with uh, Nimble Archer because that's when they, Iran fired missiles at uh, an Iraqi oil platform and one of the Kuwaiti ships was there and it actually hit that ship. And I think the captain got killed and he was an American, you know, it was, an, it was a reflag ship. We were kind of pissed, you know, cause we're waiting around. It was like a day, two days. And we were like, what the heck are we gonna do? You know, it's like they, you know, they attacked one of our ships, you know, what are we out here for? What they decided to do was Nimble Archer, Operation Nimble Archer, they decided to take out a couple of their Iranian oil platforms that they were just using as bases, basically. Our job was basically to provide anti-aircraft cover, you know, in case any any planes came out of uh, Bandar Abbas. So there were like two destroyers. They shot up one, lit it up. They just kept shooting at it. They 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 fired all kind of ordnance on it. Basically, we just said, yeah, we just left them. On, we just left a new uh, nighttime navigation aid out there, so you can see it from the fire. You know, everybody could see it. So it was, we left that burning. And then they took the SEALs onto another platform. They went on there, you know, got whatever information they needed and they blew it up and actually got to see that. They told everybody to stay inside the skin of the ship. So, you know, for safety purposes, but of course, sailors being sailors, everybody goes, goes outside, take a look. So they did the countdown. So you got this oil platform sitting on like four pylons, right? Big, big steel pylons. They do the countdown, they get down to one, they get down to zero. The explosion happens and the only thing that's left are those four pylons sticking out of the water. That was it. You know, I was like, SEALs knew what they were doing. <laughs> Living on the ship, you're, number one, you're standing watches, okay, depending on the situation. You know, you might stand watch, say, from, you know, zero eight to 12, okay, go eat. And then, and then you still got your work day, right? You're doing your work day. So like you're doing preventive maintenance on your equipment. You're, you know, you got to keep, you know, keep the ship clean. And then you may have to stand watch again at, you know, 20 to 24 or, you know, the mid watch, you know, from midnight to zero four hundred. I actually had a Marine tell me, he said, he said, I didn't realize you guys, you guys work. <laughs> you, you guys work a lot. I didn't realize like you got your, your work day and then you stand watches, you know, in addition to that. Your downtime, it's like maybe you go to the mess decks. Or back then, when I got to my first ship, they actually showed, they actually had a projector, you know, where they actually showed movies on the mess decks, you know. And then if somebody walks in front of the projector, you know, everybody gets pissed and screams at them, what have you. Or if it breaks, you know, if the movie breaks, then it's like everybody gets mad. Then they went to, you know, closed circuit TV. So you didn't have to worry about that anymore. When you went to port, when you went on a Liberty port, you hated the aircraft carrier, all right, because they have thousands of guys, you know, the prices get jacked up, you know, so everything costs more because the aircraft carrier is in, you know, so you hate the aircraft carrier then. However, when you're deployed, you want to be with the aircraft carrier because they fly the mail to the carrier and then they put it on a helicopter and then they send it out to all the small boys. You know, they do a vert rep, you know, vertical replenishment and, you know, they deliver the mail. Every division has a a male PO, you know, male petty officer. So, you know, he runs up to the post office and he gets your division's mail and he comes down, hands it out. 
everybody's looking for it. The first care package my mom sent me was beef jerky. All right, it was dried and it didn't come in the plastic, sealed plastic or anything. It was just dried, peppered beef jerky. And she sent me a whole bunch of it. So the first time I got it, you know, it's like I handed it out to the guys, you know. So I took it down to Sonar Control, handed it out. Everybody loved it. The next time I got it, those guys got, took it for me down to Sonar Control. And they say, hey, Dan, come on down to Sonar Control, man. You got a care package. I walk in and these guys are all hanging around like buzzards, man, waiting for me to open that box. And I told my mom, you know, I told my mom the first one after the first one she sent me. says, yeah, you know, thanks, thanks for the, the, the beef jerky. You know, I gave it to some of the guys. The guys loved it. And my mom got all pissed at me. I was like, why are you mad? He's like, that stuff costs like $20 a pound. Don't give it to your friends. That's for you. <laughs> I was like, it don't work that way on board ship, mom. <laughs> well, the biggest highlight was making chief petty officer. It was interesting because 114 Fire Control C School, and I, I got out of that, graduated that course by the skin of my teeth. They actually set me up and they said like, hey, you know, it's like, you keep messing up, you're just gonna go back to the fleet. You know, I'm sending you out to the fleet as a bosun's mate. You know, and you're gonna lose your advanced electronics, you know, training and all that other stuff. So they asked me, it's like, what is your goal, you know, for the Navy, you know, what, what's goal, what are your goals? So I figured I had to come up with something good so these guys would keep me, right? So I told them, yeah, I wanna make chief in 10 years. And they looked at me and they said like, well, that's a pretty lofty goal. You know, it's like, it's hard to make chief in 10 years. So that kind of impressed them, you know, so they, they let me stay, you know. I think they're gonna let me stay anyway, but he was kind of impressed with that. But I just pulled it out of my ass, you know, I just like, I, I gotta come up with something, you know. So I said, yeah, I wanna make chief in 10. I actually made chief, I took the test with seven and a half years and I got frocked at eight years. When you're frocked, you, got, you get to wear the uniform, you have all the, all the privileges and responsibilities, you just don't get paid for it yet, you know. You're still getting paid as an E6. The thing about it was, like I said, I made it in eight. And uh, so I was, I was a young chief. Everything changes, you know? I mean, I used to look at chief petty officers, man. I, I, was, I was like, damn, man, it's like, I'll never make chief. You know, when I first came in, you know, it's like, oh man, I'll, I'll never make chief, you know? And then I made it in eight and I was in Hawaii at the time in Pearl Harbor. And then I was, I remember I was, it was lunchtime. I left the ship. I was going over to uh, to the, the Navy Exchange. They had a sandwich place. They called Bravo Zulus. I was just making a beeline across the parking lot, heading over there. There were people literally doing double takes. Man, they would see me cut. They would see me, and then they look again. You know, I like, total surprise. You know, I was like, and I was getting it like over here, over here, and you know, from other chiefs and stuff like that. You know, just people like, damn. And then I went to. <laughs> I had to go to a medical, you know, had a medical appointment, you know, so I went over to medical and, and like I always did, you know, I just got in line, you know, big ass line, you know, I just got in line and the corpsman at the front, you know, she said, she looks over and she's like, oh, no, chief, come on up here, you know, I was like, cool, <laughs> just head on up, you know, it was like, it was amazing. I found out that I recently lost a really good friend of mine uh, when I was on the Stanley and his name was Chief Hidalgo, Greg Hidalgo. And he was a character. You know, the way I'm going to deal with it is by telling a sea story of, our, of one of our exploits, right? This was in San Diego. I was on Stanley, CG-32, in the Chief's Mess. The Navy had restricted travel for military personnel across the border. You know, couldn't go across the border anymore because they were having incidents. Military guys were getting targeted over there, so the Navy said, okay. Nobody's going to TJ anymore. Finally lifted, they, they announced, you know, they're lifting that restriction so we, we can go back to TJ now, right? I'm sitting in the chief's mess and Greg is telling me, hey, you know, it's like a friend of ours, Francis, he says, yeah, you know, me and Francis, you know, we're gonna go down to, to Tijuana, you know, cause uh, she got invited to sing down there, you know? He says, you wanna go? He says, yeah, sure. Our command master chief, you know, he overhears us and he says like, can I go with you guys? Like a little over a month prior to that, we were at sea and he had a, he had a heart attack, you know, a command master chief, his name was Mike, and he had to be heloed ashore to uh, Balboa Naval Hospital. So he was ready to get out. So he says, yeah, can I come with you guys? We're like, yeah, come on with us. So Friday night we end up, you know, climb into Francis's car. She's got one of these big old boats of a car, right? So we go down to the border and we go down to this restaurant, you know, it's called La, F La Fogata. We're in this club. 
she knows the, the people, the owners, you know, they're the ones that invite her to sing. We're there, we're eating, we're having a good time. You know, Mike's enjoying the music. My Spanish isn't all that great, but I love the music. And, you know, Mike's loving the music. He's loving the food. Everybody's having a good time. It's great, right? So the owners, you know, they get up to the mic and then they introduce Frances and they ask her to come up. So she goes up and she sings, you know, and, and she's just belting it out, man. She's, this, this woman just has so much soul in her voice, man. She's just belting out this song and it's great. And then the owners go up again and then they introduce this other guy, you know, another singer, and he comes up. And Francis tells us that this guy, he's like a, he's kind of like a local celebrity, you know, within the mariachi uh, circuit, whatever. And then he walks over to our table and he's singing to Francis, you know, and Francis was smiling this whole time. And then I noticed her smile just dropped, you know, she's, she's not smiling anymore. And then I look at Greg and Greg's getting pissed, you know. So then this guy finishes his song, everybody claps, and then he puts the mic down and he walks over across the dance floor to back to his table. There's four guys at that table. <laughs> the guy's like walking, he's halfway across the dance floor and Greg gets up and he says, hey, I wanna talk to you. <laughs> and the guy starts walking faster back to his table, right? And Greg goes over there. And then Mike's sitting next to me. He's like, what's going on? I was like, ah, shit. I said, stand by for heavy rolls, man. You know, he says, what's going on? He says, Greg's going over there. He's having words with that guy. You know, he said, uh, I told him, I said, he insulted Francis and you know, Greg's, Greg's talking to him. Greg starts walking back, you know, so he's halfway back across the dance floor. And then all those four guys get up and they start following him, you know? So I was like, shit. So me and Mike get up, you know, these guys are back there, you know, they're yelling and stuff. Mike's over here, you know, Greg's over here, like in front. These guys are yelling. One of their guys, one of their guys is like trying to, you know, calm things down. You know, Francis is yelling. She's trying to calm things down. And the next thing I know, I see out of the corner of my eye, Mike lands on his ass on the floor, you know? So I'm looking, I turn to look and say, shit, he just got hit. And then as I'm looking, my head just goes like that, you know, just boom. And my glasses go flying across the bar. And it took me a couple of seconds. And I'm thinking, like, shit, I just got hit. You know, and then I look over to the right, I'm looking at Greg and I see one of their guys, he's laid out on the floor, right? And now everybody's yelling and shit. I get Mike up and Greg's yelling at me. He says, come on, Dan, come on, we can take him. I'm like, dude, there was four guys over there, man. I said, now there's like five or six and we're in TJ. And I'm, just, and I'm thinking to myself, I was like, shit, you know, Navy, Navy lifts the restriction to come back across the border. And the first thing we're going to end up is, is end up in Tijuana jail, you know? when the night's over, but Greg's like, come on, Dan, we can take him. I was like, dude, no, we're getting out of here. You know, I was like, I walk over to the bar. I ask them, you know, and they're kind of looking at me. They're looking at me funny, like, like, you know, they're just looking at me weird. You know, and I just had no idea, but I just asked them, I says, hey, can I get my glasses, please? You know, and they go, they get my glasses and they hand them back to me, you know, and then I go back to Greg, you know, Greg's still yelling with these guys and there's more people in there. There's like eight guys now, you know, it just keeps, more and more. Finally convinced Greg to, to back out, to, to leave. So we're backing out towards the door, right? And these guys are throwing punches and they're throwing kicks. They're not really landing anything, you know, but you know, we're just making our way to the door, right? And we get out to the door and we finally make it out to the car. And do these guys even, you know, out to the car, they were still kicking at us, right? So we climb into the car, we head on back to the border. You know, we get to the border, it's a wait, you know, there's a long line, so we gotta wait, but it's still, you know, heated inside the car. You know, Francis is pissed at Greg, Greg's pissed at me because I wouldn't, you know, lay into these guys. And I'm pissed at Greg because he didn't, you know, <laughs> consider Mike, you know, and his heart condition and everything else. So everybody's yelling, you know, and then, you know, Greg's sitting in front and then he, you know, he's, he's looking at me, I'm in the back seat, you know, he's like, we could have kicked their ass, Dan, we could have kicked their ass. And I'm like, you could have taken them, man. I was like, why? He says, why do you keep saying that? He says, you got hit by their biggest guy and you didn't fall down. He says, that guy hit you. He saw you didn't fall down. So he ran behind the other guys. You know, he went to the back of the group. Dude, there was like eight guys there. You know, it didn't matter, you know? Francis, you know, she's yelling at Greg. She said, like, somebody could have got hurt. Dan was right. You know, somebody could have got hurt. And Greg was like, nah, nobody was going to get hurt. And she's like, why do you think that? And he said, because I had this. And he pulled out a steak knife, right? And everybody's like, everybody's eyes roll up and like, shit, you know? So we just got quiet and, you know, we, we went back home, you know, back to the ship. Next day we had a ship's party over at the, the beach off of Coronado, Naval, Naval Amphibase Coronado. 
we had a ship's party out there. I had duty, so I had, I had to stand shore patrol. So I'm standing there, I'm out there in my whites. I got a fat lip, I got a bruised jaw. And one of my guys, TM3 Hicks, he comes up. <laughs> he's, he comes up, he's smiling at me. I'm just standing there, man. I'm like, I'm still kind of pissed from the night before. And, and he's looking at me, he's like, what happened, chief? I was like, went to TJ last night. I said, bar fight? I'm like, yeah. He's like, was a woman involved? Yeah. Was Chief Hidalgo involved? Yeah. He starts busting up laughing, man. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's like, it's like, I can't blame him. I was like, yeah, shit. You know, it's like, well, yeah, once you find out Greg's involved, yeah, uh, yeah, I'd be laughing too if I wasn't here with a fat lip. But Greg and uh, Francis, they show up later and they come up to him, right? And then, and Francis, you know, she's like all empathetic, you know, she's like, She's stroking my fat lip, you know, and like, she's like, oh, man, you know, goes, are you okay? So, yeah, I'm okay. And she says, those malditos, we got to go back and kick their ass. And I'm looking at her and I'm chuckling. I'm like, really? I mean, that's what Greg was saying last night. You were saying no. Now it's like, you're saying we have to. It's like, come on, Francis. And then Greg, you know, he just, he's, he sees me, man. He's just laughing. He's just busting up laughing, you know, and I'm looking at him, man, and, and uh, I said, what the hell are you laughing at, man? I was like, and I told him, I said, you know what? When I got hit, I was just thinking, it's like, damn, man, I can't believe I got sucker punched, you know, in a bar in TJ. And then he starts laughing more. He says, you didn't get sucker punched. What do you mean? I said, nah, that dude was throwing that punch at me. I pulled my head back. It went forward and he got, he got you. I said, you son of a bitch, man. <laughs> you asshole. <laughs> I retired in uh, Ingleside, Texas. So that's just across from Corpus Christi because I was in uh, mine countermeasure ships at the time. And so it's a small base down there. And it's kind of back then it was like, a, you know, economically depressed area, so to speak. So there wasn't a lot of jobs out there. You know, they told us when we were getting out, they said, yeah, if you're going to stay down here, you know, it's like, it's not like getting out in San Diego. Say you're an HT, you got, you know, mad welding skills, you know, it's like, Back then in San Diego, you know, if you go to work for the shipyards, you'd probably make like $25, $30 an hour. Around here, you know, if you're gonna, if you find any work at a boat yard, you know, you can expect $8 an hour. I was looking for work. I was trying to find something like, you know, with the electronics, you know, anything. Couldn't find anything. You know, I kept applying to jobs. I, you know, couldn't find anything. And uh, I mean, I was getting depressed about it. You know, actually, you know, back home, because I was married by that time to my first wife, and I was just like sitting down, you know, at the kitchen table and my wife and my daughter were there. And I was just like, shit, you know, I was like, I, I can't find any jobs. I can't, I can't support my family. You know, I was crying. I hired a headhunter, you know, it's like a person that goes out and looks for your jobs. You know, they, they look for these companies, they, they, you give them your resume and they, you know, they have contacts within all these companies, you know, where they can get you good paying jobs and stuff. So I hired this woman and, you know, she called me in and she looked at my resume. She looked at, you know, everything. And she said, uh, I'm going to tell you right now, I look at your resume and everything that, that you put on there. And she says, you are by far my best candidate, but I can't get you a job. I said, why not? She says, Cause you don't have any college education in there. I was like, and she said, it doesn't matter. You don't have a degree, and that's what they look for. It doesn't. It could be basket weaving. She said, literally, it could be basket weaving, and that's what they care about because it shows that you can go, that you will go above and beyond. And I'm like, 20 years in the military, you know, it's like above and beyond. You know, shoot, you know, it's like they did 20 years. I'm doing, I'm putting in hours. I'm not getting paid for. You know, this is. I'm doing things that are more than my job description. You know, it's like, I'm a sonar technician, but hey, you know, I had to stand watch quarter deck watches. I had a damage control, you know, anything, you know, so you're doing a ton of things other than your job. You know, I was out pulling on lines when we're refueling. And she says, they just don't understand the military. They can't relate military experience to what they do. I see a lot of people, same thing, you know, it's like they get out, they can't find a job. And it's not that they're not qualified. It's because civilians don't know. They don't relate, you know, to our experiences. And then the other side is 
I finally got a job with uh, the Red Cross. It paid six bucks an hour, you know, but it was all I could find at the time. They hired another guy at the same time they hired me. Other than that, we were the only males in that organization there, in that building. And there was a, a woman there. She was a retired chief also. And she came to me and she told me, she says, Dan, watch your back. I said, she said, this isn't the Navy. These are the most backstabbing people I've ever known, you know, and they will backstab you in a heartbeat, you know, so watch your back. And I was like, thank you. You know, at least I got one person who understands, you know, who knows. And she wasn't lying either, man. Oh, they were terrible. <laughs> I mean, they were nice to, you know, they're nice to your face, right? But then it's like the first emergency we had, like I was on that team, you know, I was like, I was responsible for going out there and organizing stuff and setting up an area where people can come and request help and go out and inspect things and everything else like that, right? But I'd never done it before. You know, I figured like the Navy, somebody's going to show me, you know, what I need to know. They didn't do none of that, man. They just come in and said like, yeah, we just had a storm just come by and it just stopped over Corpus Christi, man. It's like, or, you know, like a little further out to like the little places out, out in town, little towns. And it, the storm moved in and it stopped and it rained. It didn't move, you know, for hours. And then it moved on, right? So there was like all kind of flooding damage and everything else, right? So I'm getting calls, you know, from other offices, from higher up and stuff. And they're asking, what are you guys doing? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, nobody showed me anything. And then after I, after I look like an idiot, then she gets on the phone and, you know, starts talking to people and letting them know what's going on. And, you know, she could do this stuff. She wouldn't help me, yeah. you know? So it's like, yeah, you guys are jerks, man. The church I used to go to, the pastor, he was a Vietnam combat vet. He was a Marine. You know, he was in one of those situations, you know, he just told God, hey, you get me out of this one. I'll serve you the rest of my life. You know, that's how he became a pastor. Anytime you're in that, you're in combat, you're going to find somebody who'll say that. He said, but what really impressed me with this one was I asked God to get me out of it because this one, this one was really bad. What really amazed me was not a man in my platoon got hurt. You know, we didn't, saw, we didn't suffer one death. We didn't suffer one casualty. Nobody got a scratch. For him, he says, that was God. He had a heart for people suffering from moral injury. He heard about it. You know, so he kind of delved more into it. One of the ladies in our church, you know, she saw this PBS special, you know, moral injury, the unseen injuries, right? They were having a uh, conference on moral injury in Kansas City. So me and my pastor, we went up there, you know, to check it out. Because they had people that were psychiatrists, psychologists, clinicians, VA clinicians. They had priests, pastors, spiritual leaders of other faiths. Everybody were there. And then they had veterans there that, you know, from Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, to talk about their experiences. And before I went to this, you know, before I heard these veterans talk, you know, these combat vets, I would see veterans, homeless vets on the street, you know, with the sign, you know, it's like, you know, veteran, homeless, anything helps. And to be honest, I'd look at those guys and I would think, man, you're a veteran. You should have more pride than that, you know, than being out here on the street. I used to think like that. I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm telling the pastor, I'm like, I don't even know if I should be here, you know? So, I mean, I'm just a vet, you know, I'm just a, a retired chief petty officer, you know? And he said, no, you know, he says, you need to be here. And I talked to other people and they said, like, no, we want anybody here. People need to know about moral injury. PTS is fear motivated or, or it's based on fear where moral injury is more like guilt and shame type of thing. It's like everybody grows up with a moral core. We know it's wrong to kill. We know it's wrong to murder. We know it's wrong to, you know, to hurt women and children. We know these things, but then you join the military and then you're trained to kill, you know, that's, that's your job, you know, and now you got to deal with that. So maybe you killed somebody and now you got to deal with it, you know, or maybe you injured a child, not intentionally. You're, you're shooting at this person or you just lobbed a, a grenade into a room and you didn't know that there was anybody else in there you know, other than the bad guys. And then you find out you killed a child or you killed women and children. You know, now you got to deal with that. You didn't save your buddy. You know, it's like he got hit by a sniper and you should have saw that sniper. You caused your buddy to die. Put that guilt on yourself, you know, or you're the only one. Survivor's guilt is a big example of it. moral injury. People don't know about it 
and how you treat it, there's no real specific way to treat it, but a lot of people agree is just to listen to somebody. You know, if they ever open up to you about what's going on with them, you know, and they start telling you the gut wrenching stuff, then just listen to them without judging. That's why veterans talk to vets. They, a lot of times they only talk to veterans because veterans understand what they're going through. Maybe they're living somewhere where there's no other vets. If you're a wife or a father or a mom, you know, and they decide to, to dump on you and let you know the crap they experience, you know, then just listen to them and don't judge them. It was, it was interesting because when I was at this conference, you know, people, were, they were telling, they were explaining to me what moral injury was, you know, and how the, the VA was coming around to understanding that it's out there. And up until now, they've just been treating it like PTSD. I asked them, I just, I just, I was just curious, you know, just, I, I don't know where this thought came from, but I just asked these people, you know, I said, does, you know, moral injury, does the American Medical Association recognize moral injury? And to a man and woman, they all like jumped up and said, no, you know, and I was like, what did I say? You know? And then there was a, a guy next to me. He said, you didn't say anything wrong. It's just that we don't want the American Medical Association to recognize moral injury because all they're going to do is try to medicate it. And medication is not, you know, a way to treat it. How many times do you hear vets, you know, talk about what they're, how they're being treated for PTSD. They, they get all these meds, you know, sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't, or it helps, but it's not them. You know, they don't, you know, it, they're just totally a different person when they're on their meds, you know. They may not be having nightmares when they go to sleep, but they're just not them. I describe it as a spiritual wounding. You know, I just like to pray for people over it. I mean, veterans aren't the only ones that experience it. You know, it's like anybody can have it. Like I said, if, you know, if you think somebody died and you think in some way you, you're the cause of that death, you know, you're beating yourself up, that's moral injury. Or you're driving a car, you get in an accident and somebody dies in your car and you're, that you're beating yourself up over it saying, you know, I caused their death. You know, I'm responsible for that. That's, that's moral injury. Dude, you, you put an old retired chief petty officer and ask him to tell stories. You know, it's like a chief telling sea stories, man. That's his element. Come on. <laughs> oh, thank you.